the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. All right, good Thursday evening, everyone. Rory Johnston sitting in the chair tonight for Open Line. We hope you're uh, staying safe, staying home, staying healthy. That is the key during this uh, very interesting time. The pandemic continues. Governor Bill Lee earlier on News Channel 5, his daily uh, news conference. There is now uh, beginning, to, uh, there's talks of kind of looking toward the next month or two to start reopening the economy. So that is what we would call a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. So hang in there, everybody. But we want to talk about something really interesting uh, tonight, and it has to do with human behavior and uh, how we have all dealt with this interesting situation we find ourselves in. And we want to welcome in a guest who is right here in Nashville. Her name is Kelly Goldsmith. And uh, she is a professor over at Vanderbilt University. And some people, you CBS folks, may see her as a familiar face as well. And we'll, we'll tell you about that in, in just a minute. Kelly, thanks so much uh, for being here. We really appreciate it. Kelly, can you hear me? All right, we're going to work on trying to get her, uh, her picture back up teleconferencing, you know, we have uh, uh, different uh, glitches in the system. This is what I can tell you about Kelly as we work to get her back on the line. She is an expert on consumer behavior in the face of scarcity. And if you are a Survivor fan, you may recognize her from the third season way back when in the early 2000s of uh, Survivor where she was in Kenya, I believe. 24 days she lasted in the searing Kenya heat in Africa. Uh, but to people anxious about the new coronavirus, she is actually one of a few people in the world who understand exactly what motivates everybody, especially in the beginning. If you remember about a month ago or five weeks ago when we realized that this was a serious situation, what happened at the stores? There was a little bit of panic buying. And you hoarders out there, you know, I'm talking to you, toilet paper, Purell, hand sanitizer, uh, soaps, uh, household cleaners, they're starting to come back to the shelves a little bit right now, but uh, they were gone. So she, is a, she was a behavioral research analyst before she became the youngest contestant on her season of Survivor. Then she went to Yale, got a PhD in digital marketing, examining what drives the decisions people make and why they make them. She graduated mm -hmm. in 2008 during the economic recession examined scarcity and uncertainty in a different environment, worrying about her higher ability in a time, remember the recession, two, more than two and a half yeah. million people were unemployed. Now I think we have you back. Hey, Kelly, how are you? Hey, good to, good to see you. Yeah, yeah, good good to have you. Sorry about that little glitch, but uh, no worries. we're doing what we can uh, during this time. So just introduce the audience a little bit and kind of read some of your, your resume and those Survivor fans will recognize you. Although the third season, that seems like a long time ago, doesn't it? Well, that was the early yeah. 2000s, right? Uh, it was 2001. It seems yeah. like ancient Gosh. history, right? Yeah. yeah reality right. TV, it's hard to remember a time when there was like, you know, two reality shows on yeah. the air, but yeah. we were one of them. You were one of the first, one of the first. So tell me a little bit, I tried to explain to the audience, tell me a little bit about what you're doing at Vanderbilt. So for the past 10 years, I've really been studying how uncertainty and scarcity affect consumer decision making. But what this means, I got my PhD in a related field. What this means is I basically run experiments on human beings. I expose them to reminders of resource scarcity. And what's crazy to me is what we've been showing people in the lab for the past 10 years, it's really eerie how similar it is to what you see when you turn on the television today. I was showing people pictures of empty shelves and talking about not having access to common everyday things. In right. fact, what I used to tell people is what I study when everyday people don't have access to everyday things. And then lo and behold, you know, the pandemic hits and it's like seeing one of my research experiments brought to life, which as a researcher is really fascinating, but as a human being is, is also terrifying. These are rough times. Right. Through all these years of research and doing doing these experiments, you probably never expected that you'd see a real yeah. life example of it, right? No, no. I mean, I really thought the closest we'd get was 2008. And that's what kickstarted a lot of my research was coming out 
from graduate school, graduating in a down market, I was right. exposed to these, these constant reminders of not having enough, not enough jobs to go around. Mm -hmm. And there was also a lot of climate change concerns, so a lot of concerns about global resources. And that was what got me started down this path with the research, is just knowing that, you know, in 2008, 2009, 2010, it seemed like consumers were being bombarded with these reminders of what they didn't have enough of. And I got really curious about how these reminders of scarcity would impact our decision making and also just impact the way we treat each other. Yeah, and I remember the, the 2008 uh, that when the recession hit uh, mm -hmm. and you know, my kids at the time were pretty young and I was looking at my 401k and thinking, my oh, God, shit. I'm never going to be able to get them through college. And never. and then a few years later, as a matter of fact, I think in just about a few weeks, we are going to mark the 10 year anniversary of the big floods here in Nashville. So that right. hit as well. So I remember all of those things kind of happening several years in a row. And, and it definitely mm -hmm. kind of sh it shook people for sure. Mm -hmm, of course. Yeah, I think it did. And I think we're going to be in the wake when whenever we're in the wake of this COVID-19, we're going to see a lot of that. Like you said, it shook people. We are being shaken right now. And I get a lot of questions about how long are the kind of ripple effects going to carry on in terms of the way in which we change the way we behave. And I mean, I think this could have really far reaching consequences mm -hmm. because we are all being forced to live in ways that, you know, we had to drop everything and, and change the way we operate. And I think it's no one bounces back from that quickly. So it'll yeah. be interesting to see the way it plays out. To our viewers, just a reminder, this is open line. We'd love for you to call in. 737-PLUS is the phone number, 737-7587. Uh, be sure to call in. I'd love to hear your stories at home, folks, about how you maybe prepared early or maybe you got caught and uh, ran to the store mm -hmm. and saw the empty shelves and how you reacted to it. So give us a call and join in the conversation. So uh, just last week, I went out just randomly to a store that I don't normally go to. I'm not going to name the store, but it's a large <laughs> retail store and okay. just happened to check the, the aisle, the paper towels and toilet paper aisles, and they were stocked. And oh, wow. Was, for me, it was like finding a pot of gold. I couldn't believe it because oh, yeah. I, was, I was out. I had to borrow from neighbors. And so I stocked oh, up. Yeah. And I, I grabbed and I, I only bought one of each, but I just thought, isn't this interesting how it just changed my mood that now I've got paper yeah. towels and toilet paper, you know, and it's I thinking, know. You, something you take for granted a couple of months ago. I mean, it's crazy. Um, I got a good like group of girlfriends here in Nashville. And whenever somebody hits up a retailer that happens to be, you know, stacked with supplies, you'll get the text going, Oh, they have stuff. It's such and such place. Get in your car immediately. You can go get yeah. it while they still have it. And if, I think well, number one, that's crazy. Number yeah. two, what's even crazier is how quickly I've gotten used to that feeling normal, right? Like I, I get these texts several times a week and I'm like, oh, looking forward to them and I got to get in the car. And, you know, it's it's amazing how adaptable we are as right. consumers and as humans. And in some ways that's great. And in other ways, it's really scary. I mean, the things now, why, we can get used to so Why fast. did you say that? Because I was going to say I'm proud of everyone for adapting. I mean, you know, just from mm -hmm. oh, yeah. a workflow, uh, everyone, companies here at News Channel 5, we've had to adapt and use technology. And I found it fascinating. And we've been succeeding. And we're very proud of ourselves. And mm -hmm. I'm proud of how people are reaching out. We're doing a Kindness Isn't Canceled series with people helping other people. That's great. So why do you say part of this is scary? Well, the part that's scary to me is really, you know, when you think about your life, the longer you're on the planet, the more this is true. You think you have an identity. You think you have a set of behaviors. You think you know yourself. Then all of a sudden the rug gets pulled out from you, under you. You've got yeah. a whole new way of living. And all of a sudden, you know, you're still you. So I think it really shines a light on the fact that the way we define ourselves is actually much less determined by the things that we do and the things that we buy, and it's much more determined by who we are. And I mean, it's it's sort of scary because I think we all take comfort. I mean, God knows, comfort food and comfort shopping. We all take comfort in a lot of those behaviors, a lot of the people we got used to seeing all the time, a lot of our routines. But what this pandemic has really shown us is you can take a sledgehammer to a lot of that, and we're still ourselves. And I think while that's it's sort of scary to have that realization, it's also very powerful. And to your point, it also gives you a lot of confidence in the strength that we have as humans and as people that can work together. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, this certainly couldn't couldn't do this without you know as, as at work and home with family members reaching out and I think those people who have large support systems certainly fare mm -hmm. better in a situation like this, right? 
Oh, most definitely. I mean, even it's weird, this concept of social distance, because it's at a time when we have to be six feet apart, but yet we need to rely on each other more than ever before and in new and different ways than ever before. And I've seen it personally and professionally. One thing I've loved seeing is across all the business schools, top business schools, all the business schools, I'm getting emails, I'm sending emails. Do you know best practices for case teaching online? I'm posting on Twitter, mm -hmm. people I don't know are writing back. And so really it's like, I have found this massive level of collaboration across people in my profession that is unprecedented. And I, I hope that everyone in their own fields is seeing something similar where you know it, there's a lot of help that strangers are willing to provide and quid pro quo i'm happy to give it in return if i can do anything for somebody else so i think it's great to see that generation that generosity of spirit and that sharing and that collaboration at this time because like i said we need it right we need it now more than ever before all right with that we're going to pause real quick take a quick break and we'll be right back with open line right after this